So this is obviously a very large topic, and um, when I was given this topic, I quickly decided that I, you, know, you can't, can't cover the whole of regional anesthesia, so this being an enhanced recovery meeting, I'm obviously going to concentrate primarily on abdominal surgery um, and blocks that we can do for abdominal surgery. I'm not going to talk any further about um, regional anesthesia for upper or lower limb surgery. So I'm very pleased that this session has been uh, abbreviated for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I think for a long time we've um, all agreed that epidurals are the, are the gold standard for open colorectal surgery. But recently, since laparoscopic surgery has become so much more prevalent, I think there's been um, a real confusion about what is the best technique to use for regional anesthesia for um, for laparoscopic surgery. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and to, to learn from everyone all this um, expertise we have in the audience as to what people are actually doing for their optimal um, regional anesthesia techniques for laparoscopic surgery. And secondly, I think we're all used to the fact that um, surgeons finish, uh, always finish before us and leave the operating room and leave their uh, junior to spend an age um, um, yeah, sewing up the abdomen before we finally have to wake the patient up and, uh, and get to go home. So today may be the day when we actually get to the bar before the surgeons. So to start off with, I'm going to talk about opioids in, in post-operative pain. It's been mentioned already. We know that opioids have a huge number of limitations in post-operative pain. They're not effective in movement-associated pain. And of course, they have a lot of side effects. Nausea and vomiting, sedation, sleep disturbance, respiratory dysfunction, and of course, paralytic ileus. So these are obviously side effects that we don't want in any of our post-operative patients, but particularly with um, any patients that we are trying to uh, do a sort of enhanced recovery um, type technique. So our goal, obviously, is to eliminate um, all uh, post-operative opioid use. Um, we use epidurals for all our open colorectal surgery, and part of our protocol is we tell the nurse anesthetist or the resident no intravenous um, opioids after induction of anesthesia. We try and run the patient purely on the epidural. But it's possible with epidurals because obviously you can, you can cut out somatic and visceral pain. If you can't use an epidural or if you're trying to use another technique, that may not be possible. But what we can do is try and reduce our opioid load with alternative techniques because opioid side effects are dose dependent. And if we can reduce the amount of opioid that we use, we're going to reduce all these side effects, help our patients, and probably, hopefully, have a successful uh, enhanced recovery program. So I'm going to start off with epidurals. I think most of us would agree that epidurals are the gold standard for um, open abdominal procedures for a number of reasons. Firstly, and primarily, they are the best form of pain relief. As I've already mentioned, you can avoid opioids uh, totally if you have a good working thoracic epidural. But they also have other reasons they may be beneficial in um, colorectal surgery. They may promote GI motility. You get that sympathetic blockade, so you get unopposed parasympathetic um, efferent outflow, which may promote our GI motility. There's also some evidence they may increase uh, GI blood flow. If we can avoid hypotension with our epidurals, that little bit of vasodilation may increase the blood flow to our anastomosis. And there's been some nice work in um, esophagectomies, which obviously you've got a very delicate anastomosis with a devascularized stomach that's been pulled up into the chest. That an epidural can help the blood flow to the uh, stomach. And there's no reason it can't do the same thing for any GI anastomosis. When we look at epidurals and bowel function, there's been a number of studies that have been published over the years. I pick out this one. It's a fairly small study, but what I like about this study is they made a real effort to standardize everything else that happens to the patient. And that's the problem with a lot of these studies that have looked at epidurals and bowel function. This study standardizes post-op mobilization, standardizes post-operative um, feeding, NG tubes, drain removal, etc. So it's a small study. But along with, the, along with the majority of studies of epidurals, it shows significant reduction in post-operative pain with the epidural compared to PCA, both at rest and obviously um, on ambulation on days one, two, and three. And also, they show a reduction in the ileus with uh, the epidural. And you can see here the ileus... Ooh, sorry, where's my pointer? can't see where the pointer is. The ileus is reduced by approximately a day and a half or 36 um, 
hours, and that's fairly consistent uh, amongst the studies. Also, you can see at the bottom there, the readiness for discharge is also decreased by about a day and a half. And this is well known in most of the studies that have looked at um, uh, the duration of ileus in colorectal surgery. In uncomplicated colorectal surgery, what keeps patients in hospital is their ileus, waiting for them to be able to eat and drink. And generally, once the ileus is resolved, the patient can normally go home within approximately 24 hours. And you can see that here, a direct correlation between the duration of ileus and the readiness for discharge. There's been a meta-analysis of, um, of epidurals in uh, open colorectal surgery. 16 studies, again, they showed a reduction in pain at rest and at movement. This was a visual analog score from zero to 100. You can see significant reduction in pain and also early return to bowel function. Again, about a day and a half or 36 hours earlier. So because of this evidence, the consensus recommendations we've already heard about recommend that a mid-thoracic epidural should be commenced preoperatively and continued throughout the operation. This is the same as that we do at Duke. As I said, we try and avoid all intravenous opioids. Level of evidence, grade A. But even in open colorectal surgery, there's a number of situations when we can't do an epidural. For instance, this is a common case that we may encounter. 71-year-old male for an open uh, colectomy. He's got chronic back pain. He's had extensive spinal fusions. He's on chronic opioids. And he doesn't want an epidural. So there's a number of reasons that the epidural may have been dif difficult, but of course the decision's been made because this patient doesn't want the epidural, so what techniques can we use here? Another common scenario that is getting increasingly common is someone who's on one of the newer antiplatelet agents. This lady would be a, a typical sort of nightmare case in a way. She's got severe COPD and her son, the pulmonologist, is rightly worried about post-operative ventilation. She's on clopidogrel, we can't do an epidural. What other techniques can we do in this lady to try and prevent post-operative ventilation? And of course, epidurals have problems in themselves. We all know that epidurals cause hypotension, decrease urine output. They make fluid uh, management more complicated. You're more likely to get a, a junior member of staff undoing all your good work and giving two or three liters of fluid in the middle of the night. And this is obviously, and when we talk about laparoscopic surgery, we're weighing up the balance of the pros and the cons of epidurals. This is very important. They actually impair mobility. It's harder to mobilize with an epidural, and you may keep your urinary catheter in. So all the things that we're trying to do with enhanced recovery, some of them may be harder with an epidural in situ. So what alternative techniques do we have? There's various techniques that I'm going to talk about uh, in the next 15 minutes or so. The tap block, the uh, transversus abdominis plane block, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. A newer technique, which is the subcostal tap block, uh, or the rectus sheath block, which can be used for up, upper abdominal incisions, paravertebrals, wound catheters, and, and spinal anesthesia. So I'm just tr going to try and be a little bit interactive here. I can't see you all very well. But who uses a tap block as part of their enhanced recovery program? A few hands, but not that many. How about paravertebrals? Anyone use paravertebrals? A lone paravertebral user. Um, okay. So tap blocks. Tap blocks have been described about seven years ago. This was the landmark paper that described tap blocks from the Greek and Ireland. So they looked at say, a fairly small number of patients, 32 patients, with midline incisions, comparing standard of care, which was a multimodal um, analgesic regime, with the same multimodal regime and doing bilateral tap blocks. And they did their tap blocks uh, before the patient um, uh, was incised. So pre-incision, they used a landmark technique in the triangular petit bilaterally. And as you can see, they used 20 mils on each side. And they had some remarkable results. You can see at the top there, the, the pain scores were significantly decreased in the first 24 hours with the, um, the tap block. They had a 70% reduction in their um, morphine requirements over the 20, first 24 hours with their tap block. And they also described analgesia from T6 all the way to L3. And this has been widely disputed in following studies, as, as we'll come on to later. So if we look at the um, anatomy, here's the pointer. If we look at the anatomy for our, for our tap blocks, 
We can see on the, on the right side here all, all the, um, the, ex the um, external muscles are in place. So we have the, the rectus abdominis here and then we have the external oblique. These are removed on the left side of the screen. So underneath that we have the internal oblique and then the transversus abdominis. And we can see the nerves run round from the paravertebral space into the intercostal space and then, then move into the, um, into the um, transverse abdominis plane where you can do your tap block, where they're on the upper part of the transversus abdominis um, muscle before they then go into the rectus um, sheath, where you can do your rectus sheath block, and finally, obviously, to sensory innovation. Importantly, throughout this course, from lateral to anterior, perforator blanches come through to supply the lateral aspect of the abdominal wall. For su success with our tap blocks, we want to go as far lateral and posterior as we can to be able to get these lateral and posterior perforators. And the original description by, um, in the paper from Ireland described doing the tap block in the triangle of Petit, which is behind the anterior axillary line, just above the um, um, iliac crest. However, since that initial paper, those results haven't really been able to be replicated. And like all regional anesthesia, ultrasounds are sort of gradually taken over. So the majority of tap blocks now are done with ultrasound. This paper from the French group last year actually did tap blocks using a landmark technique and then looked with ultrasound to see where the local had gone. And as you can see, they found that it was very wide variation in where the, the local was actually um, placed. And they recommended that all future tap blocks should be done with ultrasound. We perform all our tap blocks with ultrasound at Duke. So this is the technique that we use. You may use a, a different technique, but we find this a very good technique for teaching our residents. Rather than just placing the probe on the lateral aspect of the abdomen, we start in the midline. So you can see we start with our probe here in the midline where we can identify this is the actual ultrasound image here in the middle, and this is obviously it labelled on the right-hand side. So we start off with the, the linear alba in the middle, we then easily ad identify the rectus abdominis muscle. And then we start moving our um, ultrasound probe laterally. We can see that when we get to the edge of the rectus abdominis muscle, it will split into the three layers of the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, next to the uh, rectus uh, abdominis is the internal oblique, which is generally the thickest of the three layers, and obviously the external oblique above and the transversus abdominis below. We will then continue to move our probe laterally all the way until we get as far lateral as we can, and in this position we'll be able to see the edge of transversus abdominis in the beginning of quadratus lumborum and it's at this position that we want to be able to do our tap block so that we can get um, local anaesthetic to all those posterior perforators and get good coverage of the lateral um, abdominal wall. So this is how we actually perform our block. The correct way of doing it is on the right hand side. We'll say we'll do an in-plane approach where we put our needle in about one to two centimetres away from the probe Therefore, the needle appears a little way down the screen, and then we can get a good shallow angle for good reflection and visualization of our needle. We can see the needle comes here below the transversalis fascia between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. So therefore, our local can be placed in the um, transversus abdominis plane, which is at the top of the transversus abdominis muscle. If you place the local in the right place, the, the, the uh, muscle will kind of sausage out, as you can see here, and then you can almost hydrodissect with your needle. As you open up the plane, you can, you can advance your needle and continue opening up the plane all the way posteriorly to the quadratus lumborum. This is a common mistake that people do. You can see this needle has been placed, but it hasn't um, perforated the transversalis fascia, so the local was actually placed into, in the incorrect place, in the internal oblique, and you're likely to get an unsuccessful block. And in a number of the landmark techniques, when there was an unsuccessful block, this was um, yeah, probably uh, what may well have been done. There's been a, a recent meta-analysis looking at tap blocks. 
still very early days for looking at tap blocks. We, we can see they do reduce the mean uh, morphine consumption, but there's a huge variety in the, in the studies that have been shown in this meta-analysis. Different surgeries, different ways of doing the tap blocks, some are pre-incision, some are post-incision. Um, different duration of action. I think the duration of action is still unclear with tap blocks. And some of these studies include procedures above the umbilicus. And, and I'll show you in a second that I think the, the tap block is only really, the classic tap block is only really useful for procedures below the umbilicus. And this is the reason why. You can see this tap block uh, cadaveric study. They really found that you only got good um, spread of local up to T10 reliable spread only up to T10 when you injected in the classic position with the tap block. And why is that? Well, if we look at our uh, diagram again of where our nerves are, you can see if we do the tap block here, we're really only going to get spread in this region. So we're only going to get the abdominal wall from the umbilicus down. So classic posterior tap blocks. They're useful as alternatives to epidurals if we're, they're contraindicated in any way in open colorectal surgery. They undoubtedly decrease morphine requirements. Importantly, obviously, they're only getting um, pain to the, uh, somatic components of pain to the abdominal wall. They're not going to cover visceral or peritoneal pain. I'm going to talk in a second about other blocks I think we can use above the umbilicus. And finally, some people have started using tap catheters. There's very little literature on it. It's quite difficult to do. It's a very narrow plane. You have to try and, if you're trying to use a TUI needle to get into that uh, uh, narrow plane with a big blunt TUI, it can be very difficult to correctly uh, cite the catheters. So we go back to our case. You know, this, this guy is going to be a pain issue. He doesn't want a, an epidural. What can we do? Are the tap blocks worth doing? Well, potentially they are. It will give us good coverage below the umbilicus, but this part here of the wound, we need an alternative technique such as a rectus sheath block or the newly described subcostal tap. So a rectus sheath block. I told you that after the, um, the, the, the nerves run in the, in the, in the um, transversus abdominis plane, they enter the um, rectus abdominis, and the, the nerves run just above the posterior part of the rectus sheath. So we can perform a rectus sheath block under ultrasound. And so if we're unsure exactly where the, um, the rectus abdominis muscle is, which can occasionally happen in our larger patients, we can again scan laterally till we see the, the, um, the three muscle layers and then scan back to the rectus abdominis muscle. Again, you can see we're going in an in-plane technique. We're putting our needle into the bottom of the rectus abdominis muscle, just above that posterior rectus sheath where the nerves are, as laterally as we can within the um, rectus abdominis muscle. And you can see that we can inject local there. We can do that bilaterally, inject a good amount of local so we get spread up and down, and we can get some good analgesia for our upper midline incisions. However, another technique which we actually prefer is the subcostal tap lock. This is exactly the same as the tap block, but moving uh, just below the costal margin further up the abdomen. There's one important difference in the anatomy when you move further up the abdomen, and that is the transversus abdominis muscle starts coming under the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis muscle. And you can follow the, the, the layers up from where you did your first injection if you're doing a classic posterior tap as well. The needle is uh, injected in the same way. So we go right at the top of the abdomen, just uh, below the costal margin. You can see the needle comes in, again, into the transversus abdominis plane, where we can inject our local. And again, we can hydrodissect, so we can gradually move our needle uh, infra posteriorly to hydrodissect and get all those nerves in that subcostal plane. So this block can give us additional analgesia from T6 to T9 for the upper abdomen. And just a couple of days ago, we had someone just like this who couldn't um, have an epidural because of um, chronic back reasons. And we actually did four, four tap blocks. We did two classical um, um, posterior tap blocks and two subcostal tap blocks uh, and with a good result. Well, at least it was a good result in PACU. I, I haven't, uh, unfortunately, I left to come to this meeting, so I don't know how the, the patient did after that. But, uh, a good result in PACU is uh, often a good result for the anesthesiologist. Probably shouldn't be true. So what about um, 
studies in, in subcostal tap blocks. That, you know, there's, um, there's limited studies. This one is, is of interest. Um, this is a, a group just published last year that did bilateral um, subcostal tap catheters. As I've said already, tap catheters are pretty difficult to do. They actually had about a 40% rate of having to recite their catheters. I think it was 45 and a 30% failure rate. So that shows you how difficult they are to do. But when they got them correctly cited, uh, they, they did work fairly well. You see, comparing them to the gold standard, the epidural, very f this is the only study of um, tap blocks is actually compared to epidurals, which are thought to be our gold standard. They say they looked at open hepatobiliary renal surgery, found no difference in pain scores between the epidural uh, and, the, and the tap block patients. They did use slightly more tramadol, which was their um, opioid for rescue analgesia in the, um, in the um, tap block group. Again, probably predictable because you're not going to cover that, that visceral pain. Is there any surgeons in the audience? There has been a couple of recent papers that have actually described a surgical tap block. Um, so this one, 40 open uh, colectomy patients. It's the same procedure, but before the surgeon closes, they, they, um, from inside the abdomen, they pierce the transverse abdominis and put the local in from within the abdomen under direct vision. Sometimes surprisingly difficult to do, apparently, um, you know, if the, if the um, tissues aren't uh, that obvious. But you can see the results were fairly similar to an anesthesia to the uh, tap blocks. They had a 65% reduction in their 24-hour um, morphine use. So what about paravertebral blocks? And so there's got, we've got one paravertebral um, user in, in the audience. And, and when I've spoken around the States and the UK, there are increasing people that seem to be interested in doing paravertebrals to get good analgesia whilst avoiding the sympathetic block that you get with the epidural. They're particularly used obviously in thoracic surgery, breast surgery. We routinely use them in breast surgery at Duke. As some evidence they can reduce chronic pain after mastectomies. Um, and as I say, some people are using bilateral paravertebral blocks in colorectal surgery, but there's really minimal, virtually nothing in the literature about paravertebrals in colorectal surgery. They are starting to be described using ultrasound, so I'll just show you uh, briefly how we do them using ultrasound for our, for our, um, at our hospital. One of the great things about using ultrasound, of course, is that you can put the block, block in exactly the right place. So what we do, we start off actually counting the ribs. So if we put the probe just lateral to the um, um, spinal cord, we can see we can move it up and down, starting off at the first rib, and we can count each rib down. So if we want to do it the, the block at T6, we can just count our way down to T6. When we get to the, um, the rib that we want to do, the level we want to do the block, say it's T6, we will then turn the probe 90 degrees. When you turn the probe 90 degrees, you'll see the, uh, the rib with clear dropout below it, and then you'll also see the transverse and the spinous process of the vertebra, the vertebral body. Like when you do a landmark technique, you want to you know, feel the rib and then go just underneath. Likewise, with your probe, you move it just a little bit um, cordad to go below the rib. And once you do that, you'll find the rib will disappear and you'll see the pleura. Again, with a landmark technique, you don't go more than a centimetre beyond the, um, the transverse process or the rib because you don't want to... Uh, enter the pleura, and here you can see that the pleura is approximately a centimetre to a centimetre and a half below the, um, the rib. So we've got a clear landmark for where our pleura is, as well as our transverse process. So we can come in from laterally with our needle. Again, we can visualise the needle easily, make sure it's not uh, penetrating the pleura, and we're aiming for this space here, just between the transverse process and the pleura, which is where uh, the paravertebral space is, and we can easily place however much local, depending on how many levels we're doing, under direct visualisation with no danger of puncturing the pleura. What about wound catheters? I'll just briefly mention wound catheters. There have been a number of studies that have looked at wound catheters in colorectal surgery. You can see uh, this recent meta-analysis, so no real difference in, um, in pain scores postoperatively at 24 and 48 hours with wound catheters compared to control. And they concluded that the analgesic effect, if any, is not really clinical, clinically relevant. 
So in open colectomy, I think the gold standard is still uh, thoracic epidural. But we do need to have alternatives. I think we need more data on paravertebral blocks, and now we're using, we can use ultrasound to do paravertebral blocks. Maybe that will be a, a nice study that hopefully someone will do. Uh, other alternatives are obviously to do um, the abdominal field blocks. Again, there's been no literature so far looking at the combination of classic and subcostal tap blocks. So it really is a developing field as to alternatives to a classic epidural. And obviously, on top of this, we should always use multimodal analgesia. So what about laparoscopic colectomy? Increasing number of colectomies are, 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 are laparoscopic. Should we still be using epidurals in lapros laparoscopic colectomy? Well, I think the jury's out, and it, it probably depends on your institution and the patient, as we'll see in the next few slides. So this, um, this, this uh, paper looking at the use of epidurals in uh, laparoscopic colectomy, they say the same as we do. They use the continuous infusion of local and opioids throughout the case. And they found a significant reduction in opioid use with um, the thoracic epidural compared to just using PCA. And they also found a reduction in the duration of ileus. In laparoscopic colectomy, it seemed to be about 24 hours compared to control. And again, when they looked at pain scores in the first uh, 48 hours, they were significantly reduced with the um, epidural group compared to the PCA group. And we still fairly routinely use epidurals in, in our laparoscopic surgery, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Because the risk-benefit is a lot more balanced with laparoscopic surgery. That's why so many different techniques uh, are, are being used. I don't, we, in open colectomy, I think we can clearly say that epidurals are the gold standard. I don't think we can say that in laparoscopic colectomy. So we heard Mike present earlier. This is a, a um, Mike Scott, this is a, um, a paper from his group um, in, in Guildford. You can see the use of spinals in laparoscopic colectomy. You can see they had 91 patients they had important exclusions, which I'd just like to illustrate in, in the, the use of uh, these different techniques in laparoscopic colectomy. They only studied people having um, colon resections, not rectal resections. None of the patients had stomas, none were on chronic opioids, and none had an ASA greater than three. So they had important exclusions to be aware of. All the patients got a general, and then on top of that, they either got a, a spinal with a little bit of um, hyperbaric bupivacaine and, and diamorphine, or they got... Um, use of an epidural with a, with a bolus and an infusion similarly to, to how, how we do things at Duke. When they looked at their pain scores, they found that the, you know, the spinal and the epidural group, you know, the pain scores were, were very similar, whereas the PCA group, as you might expect, had the worst uh, pain scores. But when they looked at their um, length of stay, the epidural group did the worst out of the three groups, with the spinal and the PCA group going home much quicker. And in the discussion, they talk about why this is. It's interesting, the spinal group had virtually no post-optive opioids after their spinal wore off. The PCA group discontinued their PCA after 1.1 days. Well, the epidural group, all of them continued the epidural for two days. And we know that the epidural makes fluid management more complicated, so they got more fluid. It makes um, mobilization more complicated. So there's reasons in this population that the epidural kept these patients in hospital. Some important things to be aware of, we've got to compare oranges with oranges. These patients were patients having fairly straightforward right and left hemicolectomies in a dedicated center doing a high volume with an average duration of surgery of 100 minutes. And it's clear from this paper that these patients did not need epidurals. In our center, we would find that 50% of our patients have rectal procedures. We have a lot of patients on chronic opioids, inflammatory bowel disease patients, because we're a tertiary referral center. So 60, 70, 60 or 70 percent of our patients would, would be excluded from this study. Our, our mean duration of surgery is also 230 minutes, so it's very different uh, to this, this center. So in our center, the majority of our patients are getting epidurals, whereas in this center, we can see the majority of patients' epidurals are not needed. What about tap blocks in laparoscopic colectomy? Again, there's just a, a little bit of data coming out. This is from Nottingham, where I trained. 
Um, small number of patients comparing uh, just doing a PCA with a PCA with a tap block. They said they did it with ultrasound before the beginning of surgery. And again, they found that the tap block was um, morphine sparing. This was just doing the classical tap, wasn't doing a, a subcostal tap. And they found, you know, it's um, reduced length of stay by a day that didn't, reduce, didn't uh, reach significance. So in laparoscopic surgery, I think there's many different ways of doing things. I think at least um, as a kind of a, a general rule, I think rectal procedures have a lot more pain than just colonic procedures, and thoracic epidural may well still be the um, procedure of choice in, in rectal procedures. I say we get a fair number of patients, increasing number of patients on chronic opioids. Again, in these patients, we may want to consider a thoracic epidural. But in, in the, the other patients having laparoscopic surgery, there's a variety of techniques that we could use, and I think it's still to be determined uh, which is optimum. So to conclude, I think epidurals remain the gold standard in, in open colorectal surgery, but we do need alternative techniques when they're contraindicated. I think yeah, we can discuss what the optimum technique is in laparoscopic surgery. I think it may be that, that one technique doesn't fit all. You know, say I was chatting with, with, with Mike Scott earlier, and you know, what they do at their institution, what we do at our institution is quite different. But we have different patient population maybe, a different, different, um, different surgeons, and you know, maybe different requirements. I think surgical factors and patient factors are obviously very important. So finally, a couple of thank yous to uh, TJ Gann, who I've worked with in setting up our protocol, Julie Thacker, our lead surgeon, and um, Stuart Grant, who's a professor of regional anesthesia uh, at Duke, who's just written this uh, uh, very good practical guide that I got a lot of my illustrations from. Thank you very much. Thank you.